That was beautiful, Cherry. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, John. What a beautiful piece. And we have just a few weeks till we'll get to hear the premiere of the entire work, uh, September 30, October 1, October 4th, with the New York Philharmonic, uh, and Stephanie Blythe and Alan Gilbert. Um, we have two more segments of the program this evening in store for you. Uh, the first is a series of oral histories that have been taped over the last month with musicians of the New York Philharmonic who had a number of very direct personal experiences around September 11th, 2001 that you'll hear about. Um, we've been hearing so much, we've been thinking this evening about how music and how indeed poetry can help channel our emotions, help us find meaning, help us cope when there's nothing people can say to each other. Um, I think you'll find it very interesting how the musicians themselves felt that their ability to play was what they could contribute. Um, th this is a, a beautifully edited 13-minute collage of what the musicians remember from 10 years ago. Immediately following that, we will hear a performance of the Adagio for Strings by Samuel Barber. As you may know, it was composed originally as part of a string quartet. It was the second movement of the string quartet, Opus 11. Uh, a few years later, he composed it in 1936. A couple years later, made it a string orchestra piece. And it actually had several recordings and many performances before it became so famous through the radio broadcast to commemorate Franklin Roosevelt's death. Um, we'll see the video of, of uh, the Philharmonic musicians uh, recollections. We'll hear the Barbie Adagio played by four outstanding Philharmonic musicians, Michelle Kim, Julia Ziskel, Robert Reinhardt, and Eileen Moon. And we've decided to ask you not to applaud, but to take in this music as the beginning of this weekend of reflection and remembrance. Thank you very much. So we had just come from a tour in Braunschweig. It was a residency, actually, that might have been 10 or 11 days. And so we had driven then from Braunschweig to an airport. And I think, I think we flew into Frankfurt Airport and had a connection from Frankfurt back to New York. And the flight was scheduled to leave around 5 o'clock. The wife of our, one of our violinists came up to me, and I was walking past, and she said something about an airplane and a 1,000 people or something like that. I said, Luba, don't tell me. I don't want to hear it. We're about to get on a plane and go home. At one of the little bars uh, that are set up in the concourse, I saw a group of people cl clustered around uh, a television monitor. And, you know, there were lots of people around them. And then I saw one of the towers falling. And somebody said, oh, something happened, you know, an uh, airplane crashed into the towers, the Twin Towers. And, of course, we thought it was an accident at the beginning. And next to me was Glenn Dictoral. Uh, I, when I told him, his first reaction right away, he asked, is that a terrorist? The, the shock took so many forms. I would say half the orchestra was in tears and sobbing. People started to cry. Everybody started to cry, and it was It was very, very strange. It was, it, it, it was, there was such an air of unreality. My first reaction was, holy cow, where, where's my wife? She was going on interviews for courtships. And one of the places that she was going was the World Trade Center. I immediately almost panicked what happened. You never know. My daughter was working at that time in Carnegie Hall. My husband was also here you immediately think of your family. And I said, T find our children, take them out of school, and, and go up to Canada. That my, was my thought. And because uh, I, I didn't know what would happen next. And, you know, and like everybody, everybody didn't know what the next thing was going to be. 
Anyway, she's much calmer than I am, and she, she didn't do that. I could not call my mother and to find out how my daughter was. We all wanted to be home. I just wanted to be back with my family. Uh, it's the only thing I could think about at that time. We knew we weren't going to be going home after a little while, um, but they didn't know where to put us because I think there was some kind of conference or something. Every hotel in the city was booked. So showing amazing resourcefulness, they booked hotels in Stuttgart, which is not too far away, organized buses, put us on buses, and took us to Stuttgart maybe four or five hours later. Our group had to change hotels like every night not for security reasons, but just because the, you know, the, the hotels were so booked up. It used to be that in hotel uh, lobbies, there would be a big board, you know, and you could see buses were to leave at such and such, and, you know, it would say New York Philharmonic. That, of course, all went by the wayside. You didn't publicize um, that you were uh, Americans. At first there was word maybe Thursday night we could get a flight, but then flights weren't happening maybe Friday night, and flights didn't happen. And finally, we got word, I think it was Saturday. I don't remember the time, but I remember it was early in the morning, and I got a phone call, um, and they said, uh, if you can be ready to go in 20 minutes, we're going. And I said, I'll leave all my suitcases, you know, all my stuff if I have to, but I'm going, I'm going. Go. So we went down uh, into the buses, and they took us to the airport, and there was almost no one there. That flight was scary. I mean, everybody was nervous. And yeah, it felt, it felt very, not weird, but I don't know, something strange was happening in the atmosphere. And I think we were one of the first people to fly back to New York. It was so quiet as we got near New York. Nobody was asleep. Everybody was watching. And you could see out the windows. It was, by the time we got in, it was fairly dark. And you could see the lights from the work going on at the Trade Center site. You could see the residual smoke that was going up. This was in your face, we, we uh, flew very near to where the smoking inferno was. And uh, immediately upon uh, <clears throat> coming outside into the air, you could, you could smell it. And then taking the bus in to town, you know, the, the highways were just real, hardly any traffic. And then some, you know, some family members met buses and they would just, you know, hug people. I heard one lady say, you know, give yourself some time. It's not the same as it was before. We were planning to open the season after coming back from Europe with regular uh, festive special program. But due to this tragedy, there was no way to perform anything else but a requiem. And Brahms' requiem is a very powerful piece. Maestro Mazur always looked for the meaning of things, and he didn't want it to be memoriam. He didn't want it to be uh, down. He wanted to lift everybody up. And his message was hope, and the requiem he felt was hope, and we all felt that. I don't think there was a dry eye in the house. I had never played the Brahms' requiem before. That particular performance was a time for all of us, the musicians, to really bring something to the audience. My heart filled with the people. Somewhat, I feel the audience feel the same thing. And I remember that uh, as soon as we start, we start with, uh, with the national anthem, the concert, and everybody was crying. Everybody. I mean, I was looking around. I mean, I was playing. It's hard to play and cry at the same time. But it was very emotional, and, and I don't know. It was just an incredible feeling to just be back in New York and playing, especially that music. Any time the national anthem was played around that time, I was a, a mess. And I don't know why. Just, just, I, I it just hit you. It hit you. I'm, I'm, I'm an American, of course. I, I. Uh, I'm always have hope for this country, and and it, it just uh, that whole day just shattered everybody's uh, heart so badly. The performance had a consoling quality that was wonderful. Uh, for us personally, it was like we were finally able to do something after 
days of helplessness and distance, we were finally able to come back and contribute a little something and be part of it. You know, usually we're the performers, they're the audience, but this was a time when the lines were really erased. And that was, that was really great. The concert that we offered, of course, free of charge uh, for the workers and people who were at the ground zero every day happened during the lunchtime. And it was about one hour duration of chamber music and we volunteered, all of us. And there were not only the uh, bankers and uh, employees, there were also, I saw some policemen, and some firemen, so it was open to people who were at that zone at that time. There was a need, I think it was a great thing to go and play those, those concerts. If you work down there, you know, so close, uh, you know, it would be a pretty depressing uh, place to have to go day after day. There was a, a short introduction. The musicians are here to give you a little relief from what you're going through because the smell, the ash, there was still paper shards scattered all over downtown. It was like entering the aftermath of a, of a bombing. And people were, seemed to be functioning normally, but you could see the, the look still of kind of shock on everyone's face. I think it took them out of themselves. And again, it was just such a relief for us. I think it did a lot more for us than it did for anyone else. I remember being appreciated, and I remember appreciating being able to give something tangible, you know. I just kept thinking about uh, John, my, my buddy. He didn't deserve to die, you know, that day. It was like so many others. But when you have a connection like that, it really affects you. I was playing for, for, for everybody, but mainly him, you know, because I knew him. It was actually devastating to see all of it. And um, it felt really as almost like as we were there, you know, at the time. And um, to see kind of empty, absolutely empty, destroyed place, um, it was very, very uh, emotional and tragic. We were in one of the building on the site. We saw part of it. Transmigration of Souls is a wonderful work by John Adams. It, it was like a, like a space for meditation. And it really gave you time. So I just took a deep breath. <laughs> it's a deep breath work. It, 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 it encourages you to remember the ones who have, who have been lost and to grieve for them and mourn for them. And yet, feel their presence. I was very curious what he would write for that. And, 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 uh, and he really, he really uh, hit a home run with that piece, I think. It was, it was another way the Philharmonic could get involved in, in a very healing uh, way, because just there's so much healing that needed to be done. And, and certainly, that, that, that piece was part of it. The first concert that Mazel Lauren Mazel, the new music director, uh, conduct for us. It was a world premiere. We didn't know how the music was when, when we started working on the piece. And especially, I remember one part that there were some voices uh, taped you know, with the names of the people who died and, and noises from the city at the same time that we were playing the music. And we were part of this uh, whole experience. And I thought the um, audience and us, we were just one. That's basically the ideal for any performer to feel that audience is so engaged in the performance that it feels that on stage, uh, what's happening on stage and what's happening in the concert hall is absolutely the same thing. We're only, we just won. If there was a single event that made us New Yorkers, that was probably it, that really cemented us to the city. And as people who are not just living in the city, but part of its fabric. I came to New York when I joined the Philharmonic, basically. 
And whenever anyone would talk to me, where are you from? And I would say, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Indiana, near Chicago. And on that day, on 9-11, I realized later that I started saying, where are you from? I'm from New York. I'm a New Yorker. So I became a New Yorker on 9-11.